Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the 2020 Bibliometrics and Research Assessment Symposium. My name is Chris Belter. I'm one of the event co-hosts, and I've got a couple of quick announcements just in case anybody joined um, who wasn't here from previous sessions. So for those of you who were, please bear with me. Um, so we are recording the session, but we're not recording the attendees of the chat box, so feel free to participate without worrying about being part of the recording. Audio is, for broad, is on broadcast only, so all attendees are muted and um, are unable to unmute. So we're handling all questions through the chat box, um, so please use those to ask questions or to contact the speakers, contact us with technical problems, anything like that. Um, and then finally, all live captions are available in the multimedia viewer panel. So um, those are available to you also. So we are now going to pick up with our first training session of the symposium. And we're starting out with uh, Tom Zabojin from Clarivet Analytics to talk about understanding bibliometrics better to ensure responsibility. Tom, are you there? I am. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for hanging in with us all day, and uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to present here, Chris. So thank you. Uh, share my screen. Yep. And please let me know if there are any issues with that, but I think it looks like it's working well. So uh, thanks. For oh. Real briefly. Uh, this is Sorry Tom about Zemochen. that, Tom. Oh, that's okay. Uh, this is Tom Zamochin. I'm a solutions consultant for Clarivate. Um, I do have help on the call today from Ann Bynum. She's our global manager of our training team, so uh, she'll be helping me out with questions in the chat panel that you um, you send along through there. So hopefully between the two of us, we can uh, answer any questions you might have. So uh, just to kind of quickly introduce our agenda, this was the agenda that, that Chris and Yaling had presented out to us and, you know, discussing the objectives of the symposium and talking about doing what we were going to do today through, you know, the keynote presentations, the panel and poster sessions and the training. And really, it's not at all different from what Ann and I had intended to present. So I think we're going to be uh, right on point, but we're going to do it with a little different perspective. Um, first and foremost, we want to show you our newly released uh, Insights Benchmarking and Analytics Experience. So this is a tool that's been mentioned already in some of the previous conversations, and uh, we're proud to introduce a new rollout, which just occurred last week. Uh, we also want to give you a, a peek at what's coming in our future, so future solutions, future capabilities. And again, the goal here to inspire and empower the, the people on the call here today to provide that accurate, responsible bibliometric and, and research assessment um, service to their institutions that we hope for. Um, of course, we're, we're really pleased that so many organizations do depend upon us for this type of information, and uh, that goes right in line with, with some of the comments that Lizzie Gad made earlier on in the day. Um, we take our role in this, this area really responsibly and, and really seriously, and I know Lizzie was kind enough to mention a, a report earlier in the session called Profiles, Not Metrics, uh, and that hit on a lot of the points that we're going to try to cover today as we go through our solution. Um, the second thing I wanted to point out is our conversation about uh, us being friends in this space, and I think that's a really important thing with Clarivate. We try to maintain a a really neutral status, and uh, we hope you'll consider us not only as a, a friend in this area, but a collaborator. We're really thirsty for your feedback on uh, this new interface and anything else that we can do to help in the space. So uh, that'll get us going. Just want to talk real briefly about uh, our capabilities, and, and we are going to spend most of our time on uh, insights today. Uh, but I did want to point out that we do have a, a wide range of other services, solutions, and data that we can offer to our customers. And uh, this goes in that consultative environment that we've heard about so far. So, uh, you know, not just about benchmarking and analytics and, and using web-based interfaces, but providing our data through any and all possible avenues. So things like APIs and custom data, XML data sets, uh, a full suite and a full team of consultants that are PhDs that can help you produce the analyses that really answer the questions that uh, your organizations need to answer. Um, managing your research workflow with systems like Converis, presenting the information outwardly to uh, to your uh, you know people that are watching what you're doing, and, and keeping an eye on that with uh, our supportive uh, 
you know, open uh, access services like Vivo, and uh, also uh, using other evidence like our research fronts, which looks at co-citation analysis to understand where hot topics in emerging research are, are occurring. Bottom line is uh, the, the summary statement at the bottom is when you're making decisions based upon evidence, we want that evidence to be trustworthy, and we want to be able to support those strategic initiatives for you with the best data and with trusted and reliable data. So uh, that's, that's kind of a quick statement there. Again, um, just wanted to point out that um, we do have a full suite, a full group of consultancy and professional service as well to support your efforts, and that should help with things like uh, strategic planning, um, horizon scanning, key opinion leader identification, uh, et cetera. So um, I wanted to point that, uh, point that out to uh, all of you on the call today. So keep in mind that we can help you not only through our solutions, but also through uh, our services and our support people. And again, want to help you accelerate towards the goals that you're setting for yourself. Um, the next slide, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the, the importance of why you're while you're working on um, these research assessment exercises and analytics. And uh, coincidentally, I had six key points outlined here, and they match up really nicely with the six that uh, Lizzie mentioned earlier in the day. So when we talk about benchmarking against peer institutions, that's about strengthening your position. We talk about um, the funding equation, so demonstrating successful outcomes to bring funding into your organization, or uh, on the flip side, if you're a funder, looking at those funding portfolios, making sure that you're securing and, and sending those revenues to the right places. Um, using these types of tools to identify highly performing researchers to strengthen your organization, to keep the people that are there, or maybe to attract other, other um, you know, people to your organization that, that will improve it. Um, looking at your collaborations, uh, finding the best partners, the ones that are most productive, the ones that return on the investments that you make in your research enterprise. Um, we're also talking about things like open research goals. So in the interest of open science, open data, open access publications, how do you measure your progress there? How do you, how do you check to make sure that you're meeting mandates and that uh, you're, you're performing well in, in all the different spaces that, uh, that your research is being seen? Um, lastly, identifying the essential journals for your library budgets. Um, especially now, budgets are crunched, times are difficult. We want to give you tools to help you identify where you're spending your money, make sure that you're getting the best bang for um, your resource dollar out of the, uh, the journals that you're, that you're subscribing to, and that you understand the dynamics that are going on in that space as you look to control your costs and still perform outstanding work um, in your areas of interest. Bottom line for us is Web of Science is what powers that insights platform, and we want to make sure that we have the best, data, the best data to help you make the best decisions and achieve the best outcomes. So uh, you'll find that the Web of Science data is really formational in the insights resource, and a lot of the things that we do to make sure that the Web of Science data is consistent and reliable uh, and unbiased uh, percolate their way into that insights data source. So uh, we're used by quite a few of the world worldwide rankings and assessment authorities. Uh, you will see at the base uh, foundational level, the content in Web of Science is over 1.6 billion linked citations. And that creates this citation network that describes all of these interactions, all of these collaborations, all of these um, relationships in the research space. We do capture 100% of the author names and their affiliations, and that's important when you're analyzing your collaboration. Um, that list of authors um, can be daunting, especially in areas like physics, where you have 3,000 authors on a paper. We are capturing each and every one of those. So uh, we are meticulous in our capture of metadata, and that translates into benefits for you as you analyze this space. Um, the 14,000 disambiguated organizations, that's a, that's a conversation about standardization. So when you're doing benchmarking, when you're doing normalization, when you're doing comparisons, it's really important to have things classified and assembled into the right buckets. And we have taken all of those variant names and in the previous conversations about footprints and uh, about um, uh, research uh, footprints and, and things in social media, um, it's important to put all of an organization's work together. And a lot of variants get introduced into the various sources that we are looking at when we're, we're looking at index materials. And that indexing can be difficult. So by putting those 14,000 organizations together, it lets you look at not only your own output, but the output of the other large research organizations in the space. We are an arbiter of journal quality. We are publisher neutral. We do not uh, provide journals ourselves. So 
that gives us a nice neutral spot in this space where we can uh, judge the quality and, and the uh, impact and the voice of, of different journals in the space without uh, regard to whether these are, are paid journals or uh, free and, and open access journals. So I think that's a really nice thing to uh, to have in um, our, our toolkit here at, at Clarivate. Um, we're also tracking funding information in our data. So uh, from about 2000 forward, and we are now adding uh, in a lot more information retrospectively, there are about 14 million records on the Web of Science platform that have funding acknowledgements indexed and are reporting uh, that funding data. So again, a great tool for tracking uh, your impact in the, uh, the grants and funding space if you're a funder and also your, um, your use of those grants and funding as a research producing organization. Um, the, the need for additional metrics and, and diversity and uh, the information that you are tracking and, and assessing yourself upon, uh, we're covering multidisciplinary subject categories, so there are 254 of them. Um, Web of Science is often been called a misnomer because we do cover social sciences and uh, the arts and humanities as well. We're also including important uh, information from conference proceedings and books. And again, this is in an effort to inform those other discipline areas that may be underrepresented in the journal space, as some of the earlier speakers have commented. And again, at the bottom, you'll see some of the rankings that, uh, that Web of Science core collection data is underpinning through uh, either Web of Science itself or through Insight. So the AAU, the, the Shanghai rankings, the U.S. News World Report, um, the Leiden rankings as well. Okay. Um, when, when you're working with Web of Science and you're working with Web of Science data and our other uh, interfaces and platforms, you're really looking at 21,000 plus of the world's best journals. Uh, we look at their impact, we index them cover to cover, they're multidisciplinary, they are international, they are influential. We're really trying to capture the, the, the top level share of the most important voices in that space. Um, that's how we build that citation network I was talking about. Again, the multidisciplinary aspect described on the left-hand side there. Um, one of the things that's really important to us is that that journal selection and curation be unbiased. So as a, uh, a producer of Web of Science, our, editor, our editorial team uh, has no conflict of interest. They don't publish themselves. Uh, they're not on editorial boards. They have no uh, vested interest in any particular journal or publication, and that's a requirement for um, their tasks with us. Uh, we are the source data for the journal impact factor, and I, I would like everyone to keep in mind that not only the journal citation reports has the journal impact factor, but many, many other indicators that you can use in assessing what journals are important to you. So I, I know that uh, that there have been some references to journal impact factor already, and um, you know it's certainly a measurement that the industry trusts and, and respects. Okay. Um, at the bottom line, when we talk about insights, benchmarking, and analytics, all of these uh, these parameters that I talked about are moving into this platform. So we're capturing those authors and addresses. We're capturing all of the citations. We're indexing these resources cover to cover. It's international, it's multidisciplinary. We've unified uh, over 14,000 of the world's largest research organizations. So you can look at them in, in nicely organized and, and uh, distinct uh, groupings. Uh, we've also done that with over 1,200 of the world's largest and most important funders. So that same unification process applies to what we're doing in the funding space as well. Um, we're capturing all of the information from uh, 1980 to the present from the Web of Science core collection in Insights. So uh, it's, Insights is updated monthly as opposed to Web of Science being updated daily. Um, because it's a benchmarking and normalization platform, we do want to keep that baseline stable. Um, for a little bit longer than a day, uh, and that's why we're, we're updating it monthly. We could update more often, but it makes sense to keep that, uh, that benchmark in place for a, a little bit longer period of time so your reports aren't constantly moving. But um, uh, this is the, uh, the base plate that we are working with uh, within Insights. Okay, so when we talked about indicators and metrics and a diversity of, of different statistics to work with, and uh, some of the cautionary statements earlier are really wise ones. There's lots of different ways that you can look at the work that you're doing. And depending upon who you are and what you're looking to evaluate and what decisions you're making, um, all of these statistics in some way could be important. So uh, these are just a few of the metrics and indicators that are reported in Insights. Uh, over on the right-hand side of this slide, it says learn more about indicators. That's actually a link to a glossary section of our help menu for Insights that will tell you more about each and every one of these indicators that are in the product, um, you'll see that I've grouped them out a little bit too. So 
productivity and impact uh, can be measured by things like document counts and H index, but uh, the cautionary statements about quality versus quantity are really important. So when you get into a normalization exercise, it's really critical that uh, you keep in mind that uh, higher isn't always better, and um, citations don't always equal impact. So that's why all of these other metrics and statistics and um, indicators are available in our products. Um, it's not so much important about how much you do, but how good it is in a lot of these situations. And we want to give you the parameters to look at your organization, look at your discipline area, look at your teams, uh, look at your collaborators, look at your funders from all of these different aspects and, and look at these on a global and multidisciplinary basis. So all of these things are in there. Um, there's two that have a, a red box around them. Those are fairly recent uh, additions to our indicators panel, and we'll look at those today during a live demo. So we are going to talk about the, um, the product in, in more detail when we go to the live demo, but I want to just give you a, a little idea on what's to come. Okay. Um, a basic thing. So I know that there's a mix of experience levels in this group, and I know there's a lot of people on the phone. Um, the experts can um, kind of nod their heads while I do this, but, but if you're new to this area, I think it's really important to talk about uh, numbers and context. What does normalization mean? And uh, I'm going to do this in a very basic fashion, but we'll go through it really quickly. So um, we've heard some statements earlier about making sure that when you're normalizing information uh, on citations that you do it by category. So uh, mathematicians are not cited anywhere nearly as often as uh, biochemists or uh, physicists. So uh, it's important to keep in mind that uh, one of the apples that you are comparing to other apples is that category itself. Um, the citations can vary quite significantly by discipline. Um, it seems really obvious when I describe this, but a lot of people don't think about this in the heat of the battle, and that is that time normalization is important as well. So older articles that are the same quality as newer articles have been around longer and therefore can garner more citations over time. And citation maturity rates can differ between fields as well or on particular topics. Think about what the dynamics were like right now for citations on COVID-19 papers uh, versus um, Boson, Higgs boson particle papers that uh, came out a few years ago. They're going to have very, very different citation curves, and uh, it's very important that you keep that in mind when you look at these comparisons. The third thing is document type, and uh, one of the previous speakers mentioned removing documents from her analysis that are, are not articles or review articles, taking out things like editorials and, uh, and news items. So that is important here as well. So citations are going to differ by document type within a journal. Um, reviews obviously are more generally heavily cited than articles, and original research articles are a lot more heavily cited than editorials and book reviews that may go unsighted. So that's always important to keep in mind as well. So when you do these apple to apple to apple comparisons, uh, we're expressing things in relationship to expected or average performance for these large cohorts of data that we can extract from insights and compare to each other. So when we talk about uh, category normalized citation impact or, or um, uh, journal normalized citation impact, we are looking at the expected performance of uh, an article in a category, an article in a journal, a type of article from a particular time in a particular category. And uh, that normalization is all about putting the data into context. So is this particular entity performing better or worse than the expectation for a journal or a category? And what's really important here when you're doing this normalization is you do need to take a stand. You have to have expertise in how to classify apples so that uh, these comparisons are as accurate as they can possibly be. Um, it's not good to put something in multiple categories just to put it somewhere. Um, you need to do, uh, kind of make a stand on, on what you're doing. We have. Um, we have experts in, in curating and examining this, uh, this literature and these journal titles to make sure that these, uh, these comparisons are in the right place. Okay, so we did release a new um, insights uh, interface, uh, a new user experience, and when I say we just released it, I literally mean we just released it last week. So um, for many of you that even uh, that are subscribing to this uh, insights tool, uh, you may be seeing this data for the first time, so uh, or these types of um, uh, visualizations for the first time. So I am going to spend some time uh, talking to both our experts and our uh, less experienced users when we go through the demo. Um, some things that I wanted to talk about, though, before we get into the demo are some uh, some things that we are adding to uh, insights in the last year, uh, year and a half. So there are some new features in here. I want to make sure that you don't miss the ability to, uh, to do these analyses in your product uh, when you go back to your desktops at home. 
Uh, but I did want to point out that we are, as a, you know, as a publisher independent um, source of data, uh, we did a lot of work to fund um, the uh, unpaywall work that was going into identifying open access articles uh, at the article level, not just the journal level. So in Web of Science and Insights, uh, you will see that there is full accessibility to the status of uh, the different articles that are available in these analyses, uh, not only at the the DOAJ Gold level, but at all open access levels. And those are broken out and grouped out for you. So you have full transparency on uh, those green, gold, bronze hybrid articles in, uh, in our products. And that really helps you when you're benchmarking your, uh, your open access footprint against peers, when you're looking at um, whether you're meeting uh, open access mandates when you publish, uh, if you're a funder, uh, if your uh, funded organizations are, are doing the same. So it can be really powerful for um, you know, looking at your, your decision making on um, your journals, which ones have the most impacts, which, one, uh, which ones are, are providing you with the best return on your investment and delivering on the promise there. Another uh, functionality that we added is the ability to track author position. Now, author position relies a lot upon uh, both the, um, the affiliation of the author and the, the ability to tie that affiliation to the author name. So. Uh, Keep in mind that um, a lot of our customers have asked for this, so this is something we put in really at, um, at the demand of a lot of our customers. And keep in mind that the author position isn't always significant in every field. So again, keep in mind that discipline area could be important here, but we have the ability now from 2008 forward to identify the first author on a publication, the last author on the publication, and a corresponding author on a publication. So if you're looking at analyzing your research output, the work of your researchers, their contribution uh, at different levels to the articles, uh, you will be able to uh, look at that as a metric in, uh, in Insights as well. So that functionality is already in there. Okay, um, those of you that have been working with our author record beta, uh, this is a, uh, an author grouping, an algorithmic tool to bring uh, author information together with the help of the curation of the authors themselves. So we feel it's important to try to assemble this information reduce author variance, address the um, disambiguation issue as effectively as we can, and we're finding that this author record um, algorithm, which uses all of the metadata that we are extracting for each of these uh, authors, their institutions, their articles, to assemble the variant names of authors together into one place and, and to smaller um, and more focused groupings. Um, this has actually contributed to us dropping down to 50% fewer researcher name variants in uh, our modules in Insight. So it's been really, really helpful. Uh, we'll give an example of how that looks a little bit later on, uh, and you will see that feature both in the Web of Science and now this author record uh, extraction into Insights as well. Okay, another um, visualization that was recently released is, uh, was uh, released in Q3, and that is our impact profiles. So one of the things that um, was mentioned earlier on was looking at profiles as opposed to metrics or individual statistics. So this is a great way to look at a comparison of different organizations uh, and how their citedness varies in their uh, research portfolio. So uh, in this particular uh, graphic, we'll, we'll show this a little bit later on, but you can see that we've, we've grouped uh, the papers from, uh, on this particular screenshot, it's Harvard and NIH looking at the total numbers of documents that they have. and the citation impact that was achieved by those groupings of documents. So you can look at that portfolio not only as a snapshot, but also over time as well, a much more nuanced comparison of, of how the, uh, the different um, uh, output um, profiles of, of these organizations look over time and over a time progression. Uh, we've also uh, provided unification in our publisher information and insights. So uh, this was released in uh, second quarter. The nice thing about this is you can look at a publisher's entire portfolio in one click in Insights. That's going to reduce the overlap and the double counting problems that you might have with the different publisher uh, brands and sub-brands that, that might occur out there. So a lot of folks have found this really, really helpful for uh, you know, assessing their collection development strategies, uh, making sure that they're looking at the, uh, the different types of journals and the different uh, uh, portfolios from the different publishers. Uh, in a much more organized and, and unified fashion. So again, standardization and unifi unification are really good in the, uh, uh, in the world of benchmarking and, and normalization. Okay, um, so I'm gonna jump from our um, slides over to 
a live demonstration of insights at this point. So I'm going to jump into the new interface. Um, I know this will look new to many of you, if not all of you. So what I wanted to point out was um, really some, some uh, formative changes in the interface and how it looks. I am logged into the platform. It is integrated with uh, within the, um, uh, the, the Clarivate suite here. So you can see that I'm, I'm accessing multiple uh, products at the same time when I log into the Web of Science. So probably the most noticeable change is at the, at the um, welcome page to the Insights platform now there are multiple options here. Um, we've simplified and streamlined the process, so if you want to do an analysis and dig into the data, you have a way to start an analysis here. Um, you also have the same icons uh, or, or menus at the top that we had in the previous product. So there's a couple of different ways to get into the different functionalities. Um, we've kind of designed some of these for the power users and others of these for maybe a, a more um, uh, new, uh, a more uh, a nuanced aspect for a, a beginning user, someone who doesn't know how to use the interface or may need a little help along the way. So uh, analysis here, um, you can start an analysis by clicking this button, and you can also click the Analyze button at the top, and it will take you into the different entities that you can do analysis on and insight. So we can look at things from the aspect of researchers, organizations, uh, geographical locations, research areas, uh, subject categories. Um, journals themselves, and funding agencies. And again, this is where that unification comes in. There's 14,000 plus organizations, there's 1,100 plus um, uh, funding agencies. Um, the second tile over is talking about reporting. So this is a place where um, you can explore reports, get ideas on what types of analyses you want to run. Um, and also at the top here, you're going to see that you can run overview reports right from the top menu bar on organizations, on researchers, and if you have the My Organization plugin to uh, Insights, also department-level reporting. Uh, now, that's a little bit different in that we do need um, to work with you on that in a consultative fashion to make sure that your organizational hierarchy is represented and that your authors' papers and uh, organizational levels are all linked together. So we would work with you to help you help you do that, or uh, you can provide us with that information yourself if it's already organized, and that will enable uh, you to run reports not just at the research level or at the total organization level, but at uh, a level that matches the departmental structure of uh, your internal organization. The third tab, um, section over here is the organized section, and this is where you're going to save folders, um, maintain a dashboard, um, socialize and share reports with colleagues. So those three main buckets here. Uh, what I'd like to do, though, is I'd like to start um, showing you how we would build some reports within uh, the Insights platform. So to do that, I'm going to start right at the top here with these overview reports. And uh, we call these um, overview reports or system reports. I'm going to run an organization report uh, right off the start. So I'm going to go ahead and click a button here, and you will see that the organization report is opening a grouping of templated uh, tiles. And each tile is its own individual analysis that make up a report. Um, now, you have the ability to choose any one of those 14,000 organizations uh, that are in here, and I saw a little shout out from Karen. So I will tell you, Karen, that I'm an alumnus, and I actually worked in the Northwestern Science Library as my work study job way too many years ago to even comment on. But um, uh, so I've chosen Northwestern University just because I knew one of our earlier speakers was representing it, and I went there. Um, they're also a great research organization, so they're a terrific example for uh, the organization report. So as I scroll down, you'll see that I've entered in Northwestern University. It's it's simple enough to do. Just start typing it in here, and uh, the the organizations that are unified in the product are going to start coming up in this type ahead. Obviously, Northwestern's already been added. Um, you can select a date range, and I mentioned that um, the date range goes anywhere from 1980 to present. You can select whatever range you want to work with, and the rest of the reports are going to populate based upon that information. Now, as I scroll down a little bit further, you're going to see that I've included the Emerging Sources Citation Index documents. Those are journals that um, are, are rising stars in, in research niches or, or emerging research countries. These are journals that don't yet have an impact factor, but they are starting to have a voice in their field or their area. Um, below that, you're going to see there's different tabs here, so research performance, collaboration, journal utilization, and then there's a fourth tab here that talks about most cited documents. So we have lots of different ways that we can uh, report on the data that's in Insights. And as I scroll down, you're going to see we've got one here that's talking about 
documents published in uh, GIP research areas. These are large research area buckets. And you can see that we have a pie chart here, and it's kind of broken out that way. There's another uh, report here that's talking about documents published by Web of Science categories. And you'll see that there's a tree map here that's explaining the different categories that those documents occur in. So I've already got a lot of really granular information about Northwestern University just by typing in the name and putting in that 1980 to 2020. I hope my computer isn't going to restart. Um, okay. Um, productivity. We've got documents published per year. And you can see that's rising for Northwestern. So this is a trend on output. We're looking at time cited per year. Again, a trend on output and a trend on citation. Um, here's category normalized citation impact per year. Um, so this is Northwestern's annual performance against the expected in its different categories, its different subject areas by year, uh, by field, and by time. And you can see that uh, Northwestern is hovering well above what would be the uh, U.S. baseline and well above what would be the global baseline. So they're performing very, very well and, and, uh, and continuing to perform well over time. We can look at things like documents published per journal impact factor quartile per year. So is um, Northwestern publishing in the right journals to, to be seen, to be heard, to be cited? Um, so this is a good statement. And of course, you want to have your, your articles published in the journals that are uh, garnering the most citations. Um, below that, where are, we, um, where are we publishing our documents by journal quartile? How are we performing by category normalized citation index in specific categories of literature. So again, this is that uh, profiles, not metrics, and this is that, that way to look at how you're performing by category and making sure that you're normalizing for those different fields. So you can see that uh, Northwestern is very interdisciplinary and performing very well, not only in categories like engineering, but categories like arts and humanities. So uh, lots, of, uh, lots of great reports here. Um, for academic institutions, we are also capturing reputational information. So you'll see information about research indicators. How does the world view Northwestern in terms of its research performance? How does the um, academic world view teaching indicators um, how, at Northwestern? How is it seen as a teaching school? Um, now, that's the first tab. So I've got, between these four tabs, about 20 different report templates. And what I can do is I can work with these. I can change the name of the institution that I'm working with and produce these same reports for all of the other 14,000 that are in um, the, the Insights uh, groupings. Uh, maybe I want to look at Northwestern's collaboration activity. So if I move over to this next tab, you're going to see some different graphics, collaboration by country and region. Maybe there's an international collaboration mandate. Uh, maybe we're looking at the growth in Northwestern's international collaborations by percentage over the course of the year. And this is where that, that information that we're capturing in Web of Science is really important. By having uh, the address information and the affiliation institu and, and institution uh, information for authors, uh, their address information, we're going to be able to capture that internationality of collaboration in insights when we port that data over. Same with countries and research areas. So this is all uh, driven by that Web of Science metadata that we're capturing. Because we are capturing uh, the addresses and uh, the unified institutions, we can tell you who Northwestern is collaborating with most frequently. And these might be number of citations or numbers of papers. Uh, we can also do this for category normalized citation impact. So not just Northwestern's collaborating on lots of documents, but which collaborations are producing those that have the highest impact. Um, who are we uh, collaborating with most frequently? Not surprising, we're seeing some of Northwestern's internal collaborations here with Feinberg School of Medicine or the Children's Hospital of Chicago. Um, let's go over to the next tab. I mentioned that in this system report, we also have the local journal utilization report. It's now embedded in Insights, and this is a great collection management tool. So without doing a whole lot of work, Northwestern could plug this report in and determine which journals they're outperforming the average journal citation rate in and rank those. Which journals are they publishing in most frequently? Uh, do you want to subscribe to the journals in which you're publishing most frequently? Um, which journals are Northwestern University's authors citing? Um, are we subscribing to those journals? Are, are the authors at Northwestern citing recent or older material? This might inform your archive strategy or your collection strategy for those particular titles. Um, which journals are citing Northwestern University authors? Um, are Northwestern University authors being cited by recent or older material? So some great information here for the collections librarians and, and determining their strategy. Now the other thing that we're grabbing out of here is the most cited documents. So 
uh, one of the things that's really important with uh, these types of reports is not only that you can get the data, but that you can get it out of here. So um, we have these different types of reports, and you're able to view that data and export it um, into uh, other visualization tools or, or other um, you know, spreadsheets and, and uh, reporting platforms uh, as you wish. So uh, that's the other powerful thing here. And, you know, the, the power of this, this platform is assembling everything together, putting it all together neatly, quickly, and then you can get more granular and drill down into that data. One of the things I wanted to point out, let's go back over to our research performance tab. And I'm going to look at this documents published in Web of Science categories. So one of the things you'll see, this ellipsis here, the three dots, if I click that, I can open this analysis. And what's going to happen here is I'm going to take this tile that's on this system report that's been created for me, and I'm going to open the analytical panel in the Web of Science, I mean, in the Insight, sorry. Um, and you will now see that the data that formulated that particular report, that particular tile, is now available on my dashboard. And I can edit it from here. So. I'm looking at a full panel of different filters, different indicators, and different baselines that I can add to my analysis. One of the things that you'll see is we have a table and we have a visual, and you can toggle back and forth between the two of those. So here's the table that was on my report originally. You can see it's showing the top five discipline areas for uh, Northwestern in terms of document output, obviously a strong chemistry school and material science school. And I can adjust this a little bit. Maybe you can say I want to look at the top 10. So I can adjust my um, number of entities that I'm looking at. Um, I can adjust my visualization as well. Maybe I'm not uh, overly crazy about this tree map and I want to look at a bar graph. So uh, one of the nice things is we have a new tool uh, here to choose different visualizations. It gives you a little thumbprint on uh, what, that, um, what that report is going to look like um, in the visual. So this is a nice way to toggle back and forth between the visual aspect of the report and the tabular aspect of the report. And you can see that we can apply different filters here. Uh, if you remember on the original report, we set our, um, our uh, times, our publication dates from 1980 to 2020, but I can choose a custom year range. I can pick a particular set. I can look at the last five years of data. You'll see that if I change my year range, it's instantly updated my report. So if I'm looking at a different time span, maybe I want to look at um, year to date 2020, um, you can see how quick and easy it is to adjust this and look at uh, different ranges. And maybe I want to look at, um, you know, how Northwestern's done since I graduated. That'll tell you a little bit about how long ago I went to school there. But, um, uh, you know, this is real simple and, and real easy to do. Now, some other things that I might want to do is I might want to adjust some of the metrics that I'm looking at. I want to might, might want to add some indicators. might want to look at things a little bit um, differently. So let's, uh, let's do some things here. Maybe I'm not so much interested in my document cited and percentage of that. I'm going to remove this column. So I can start adjusting my, um, my table a little bit. You can see that each of these um, columns has a, uh, an indicator associated with it. Um, uh, and you can see we're looking at documents, time cited, category normalized citation uh, impact. I can add different indicators here. So maybe I want to look at our performance at Northwestern in the open access space. So if I click this add indicator button here, you will see that I can scroll down and there's a whole listing here of all of the different indicators. So maybe I want to look at the number of uh, open access documents. And you can see that just that quickly, I can go ahead and I can start adding these different indicators. And maybe I want to add um, uh, an analysis here where I'm looking at uh, green published documents. And maybe I want to look at um, the percentage of all documents that are uh, open access. So how's, uh, how's our mandate looking? So let's add that one as well. So I can add these, um, these indicators to my table and uh, go ahead and, and look at those uh, indicators in lots of different ways. So, you know, how's my performance in chemistry in open access versus my performance in oncology? Not a surprise that the healthcare related areas have a much higher uh, open access percentage. So these are different ways that we can look at these and I can sort and filter on any of these indicators. So the highest area of open access documents at Northwestern is parasitology. Who'd have known that? But um, uh, these are different things that you can sort on, different things that you can um, add to your analysis. Now, the, the other thing that um, I had mentioned uh, a little bit earlier on was in addition to um, adding those, um, those different indicators to the table, 
there's a transparency level in the product that uh, that works nicely as well. So uh, you will see that a lot of these numbers here are lit up. Um, data can be exported from this platform. I can export tables. I can export visualizations by clicking this little icon here. It's going to give me the ability to um, export all of this data, including the trend data year on year if I want to do that. Uh, but one of the things I did want to point out is there's 10,000 documents here in multidisciplinary chemistry that are at the top of the chart for Northwestern. If I want to look at those 10,091 documents, all I have to do is click on it. Now, those documents are already put together for me, and I have data on all of those articles in this table that's going to tell me um, in this particular field at Northwestern that the most highly cited document has 5,651 times cited, and it's performing at 38.7 times the category um, expected um, I'm sorry, the, the category expected citations are 38, um, but that's 146 times what's normally expected in this particular chemistry category for an article published in 2007. So you have article level metrics, you can export this data, you can download the table. Um, now I can also look at um, which, um, I can also refocus this information and I can say which researchers are publishing in this particular entity. So we're looking at multidisciplinary chemistry. I can refocus my analysis, and it's going to take me down to the next level when I click go. So I'm drilling down into this data at the next level. I'm looking at, um, you know, particular researcher names, and, you know, maybe here I don't want to use a, a bar chart. Maybe I want to use a different, uh, a different type of visualization. Uh, it might be a, you know, bubble graph, something like that. Um, different visualizations to look at uh, the authors. I could use a uh, maybe a scatter plot. So there's different functionalities here with um, with this tool, and I can look at this in different ways. And you'll see on this particular scatter plot, I'm looking at the top authors. I can look at their let's look at their web of science documents, the number of times they've been cited, and then I'm particularly concerned about their category normalized citation impact. So I'm going to make the point radius and you'll see it down here, that's going to be their category normalized citation impact. So you'll see which authors are producing the most work, which authors are being most heavily cited, and which ones have a, an outsized influence in their particular research area. So all of these things are, are things that I've done right from the, uh, you know, I've taken that uh, original report. I can go ahead and I can add this to another report. I can save this tile separately now that I've made all of these changes by clicking Add to Report. It'll let me go ahead and give it a name. I'm just going to call it NIH for today. Oops. And I'm just going to give this a name test, and I'm going to put it on my dashboard. So I can save these tiles, and they'll be saved to uh, the foldering system or the dashboard system so that I can retrieve them later. They'll update automatically. And uh, when we go back out to the organized functionality, I'll show you that that tile has now moved over to that dashboard and I have it preserved there. So uh, this is one report I wanted to show you. Let's go out and run a different report. I'm going to go back out to our homepage with Insights. Um, one of the other things that someone said they wanted to look at was uh, collaboration. So I'm going to use one of these new analysis tools. We call it a starter analysis. If I click this, it's going to say, what do you want to know more about? Well, I want to know more about collaboration. So there's a, f a functionality now in the new insights, and you'll see that when I go to this analyze screen, it's telling me that there are tools to help me understand the flow path and the use cases that people are looking at for organizational performance, for collaboration, for organizations, researchers, journals, et cetera. So these are little uh, pathway creators that will help you understand how to run these different analyses. Now, I'm interested in collaboration, and this tool is going to help me. And maybe I'm interested in looking at which organizations collaborate with mine, and which ones collaborate most frequently, and which ones have the most impact. So I'm, I'm going into this as a maybe a less sophisticated user, maybe someone new to the interface or someone that doesn't use it as often. So if I click this little helper here, this starter analysis, it's going to say, what do I need to do? Well, you want to find collaborating organizations. Let's walk you through the steps to find organizations collaborating with yours. I click next, it says, okay, you want to click on the organization's entity dropdown. They'll start the analysis using this entity, and it says click the start button. It will take you to the relevant entity where we can continue with our analysis. And it's going to take me to the screen that I want to work on. 
and it says, okay, you want to you want to look at a collaboration with a specific organization. So let's let's click that, and it's going to tell us we're going to go to this collaboration with organizations. After we get through the last couple of steps, it says you can apply your filters. The data is going to be visible in the table. You can search, sort, download the data, plot it to a visualization. Okay, I'm going to dismiss that guide. I'm left right here, and uh, my organization of interest today is NOAA. So I do most of my work with the government agencies. Uh, I'm going to give a shout-out to my friends at NOAA because I know they're using uh, Insights. So I'm going to look at NOAA's collaborations. I'm going to update my results, and you will see that Insights has very quickly built this collaboration network for me. So um, I can look at different filters that I want to apply onto this collaboration report. Uh, one of the things that I'm interested in with um, NOAA's collaborations is not just um, – Let's change this a little bit. I'm going to look at their Web of Science document. So now I'm looking at this collaboration by the number of um, documents that um, that NOAA has collaborated with on these different institutions. So NOAA is the center of my collaboration network. You can see they collaborate a lot with NASA and NCAR and other government organizations like NASA Goddard. Um, they're also collaborating with academia, and there's a NOAA location in Boulder, Colorado. So not surprisingly, they work quite closely with uh, University of Colorado. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say let's look at uh, applying a filter here. I want to look at a filter by organization type. Maybe I want to look at just NOAA's collaborations with other government organizations. And that quickly I can update my results. And now I've got a, uh, a graphic that's showing me their top 10 or top 15 collaborators in the government space. So a great way to look at um, those collaborations. Now, these are grouped by Web of Science documents, but maybe I want to know more about where my most effective collaborations are occurring. So maybe I want to look at category normalized citation impact. And this is going to tell me which of those collaborations have a higher impact than others. So this is a great way to look at the success of those collaborations to really identify uh, some of those patterns and, and understand where those collaborations are producing the most impact, producing the most um, citation success. So there's a second report I wanted to show you and just kind of run that for you. Let's do a different report. One of the things that you can do within Insights as well is that you can, um, you can work with custom data sets that you export from the Web of Science. So I'm going to do an analysis on uh, maybe the funding space. So let's look at funding agencies. And when I go to funding agencies, I'm going to change my data set. I'm not going to use the Insights data set that that data set that goes all the way back to 1980 and has all of those discipline areas. Earlier in the day, I did a search for COVID-19 uh, records mentioning vaccines. Now, of course, these are recent, so we don't need to worry about 1980. Um, but what I did is I said, let's look at the funding agencies that are funding work in the COVID-19 space. And I'm going to go over to my table because one of the things I want to look at is which organizations, there's 122 listed here on the, the 296 documents in my table. Uh, I am going to, um, I'm going to add a baseline here. So one of the things I want to know is what's in my, what's in my data set. So I'm going to add a data set baseline. You can add these baselines over in the same panel where you're adding filters and indicators. And now I know in my entire data set that I ported over from Web of Science, I've got 1,356 documents. So now I'm seeing the funders that have supported this research. And this is a very recent snippet of data, right? We're looking at, uh, you know, 1,300 or so um, articles from uh, the last year. And we can tell who's funding in this space. And you can see um, I've added to my table, I've added um, these uh, indicators for the number of hot papers that have been produced, the number of highly cited papers that have been produced. This is an integration with our essential science indicators module uh, in the other part of the Insights platform. So we know that, that many of these papers are being highly cited in their field. They're in the top 1% or even top 0.1% uh, of their field over the last, in this case, year, right, last year or two. Um, we know which ones are open access. So how collaborative is the COVID-19 space? Everybody's supposed to be working together, right? Uh, well, there's 81 documents here that were funded uh, by the National Institutes of Health, um, and 80 of those are open access. So what's interesting here is it's really – pretty clear correlation that the work in the, um, in the COVID-19 space is being made freely available. So the mandate is being met for making sure that this information is out there uh, and it's being shared. So that was another tile I wanted to show you. 
Uh, I'm going to run another report for you as well. So one of the things that uh, is real challenging in uh, in our world, in our biblio bibliographics and bibliometrics world, is looking at authors. It's always difficult. Now, what I want to do is I want to do an analysis by researchers. Um, always a challenge, especially because so many names are, and, and so many common names are out there. I'm going to clear my filters because I, I figured I'd do a maybe a collaboration um, uh, aspect on uh, a particular author. So I'm going to look at, uh, let's go down here and let's look at uh, collaborations with people. And we're going to use the new Web of Science author record beta. I'm going to pick an easy one. So let's pick uh, somebody that hasn't published too many documents or participated in too many documents. So we're going to we're going to pick this particular person. Maybe you've heard of him at the NIH. And I'm going to search for uh, another variant of, of his name as well. I know he's published under that one. I'm going to update my results. Um, and you'll see how quickly this Web of Science author record beta has gathered together all of the, the collaborations that Dr. Fauci has performed from 2015 to 2019. But you know what? Let's challenge this a little bit. Let's go out to 1980 and 2020. And you can see we've got a tremendous amount of information here on, uh, and let's change our visualization. Let's go to, uh, maybe go to a bar graph. That might be more insightful here. And let's uh, let's sort this by uh, Web of Science documents in our table. So you can see how quickly we've gathered together all of Dr. Fauci's work on 1,203 documents going back to 1980. He has more, but they're before 1980, so they're not in this analysis. I can identify uh, which people he's collaborated with the most. I can identify uh, which people he has um, been cited with the most. I can identify which people he has collaborated with on the most highly cited papers in their field. So, And I can get to those papers. So I can click this for, and I will see the paper level information for uh, all of that work. So uh, a really powerful tool to grab lots of information, put it together all in one place. Um, I do realize that I'm running a little um, short on time, but there is um, a couple other things I want to go back to in my slide deck. So at this point, I'm going to jump out of the live demo and go back over to my slides because there's a couple of things on the horizon with Web of Science and Insights that I want to let you know about, and I think they tie nicely into the conversation we've had so far. So uh, let's talk about some things that are coming up for us. So uh, we are uh, about to release probably before the end of this year. Uh, a more granular article level topic classification scheme, uh, a macro, meso, and micro level. So every document will be assigned to um, locations in this three level hierarchy based upon citation relationships. We developed a clustering algorithm working with um, the CWTS. Uh, this is our Institute for Scientific Information, our, our um, thought leadership organization within uh, Clarivate. Um, these document uh, level classifications will really help us build uh, a better understanding of the research ecosystem. You'll be able to look at these uh, documents at each level. And uh, one thing that will be nice about these citation topics at these different levels is uh, at the micro level, any given document is going to be assigned to one micro topic. So look at the granularity that we have now with research area or research topics and drive that down to an even um, uh, more infinite level in terms of these macro, meso, and micro sites. So look for this coming soon to Insights uh, before the end of the year, most likely. We are also, uh, in line with some of the comments made earlier, looking at information outside of the journal space. So uh, our grant information, we already have a lot of information about funding uh, in our product, who's funding what and where. Uh, but we are looking to augment that data with a lot more information about the values of the grants. Um, we already have information like grant numbers and things that we are capturing from funding acknowledgments, but we want to capture the impact of grant grants. We want to capture the impact of patents uh, and, and build that citation network uh, even further. And I know people were mentioning reports and uh, that sort of thing. We do capture citations uh, in the bibliographic information of the cited references of uh, Web of Science, we are capturing items that we don't even have as source items uh, in our content. So keep that in mind as we move forward. We have uh, opportunities to expand and, and develop there as well. Um, I mentioned the um, uh, the other content. So preprints are, are growing in importance. I think it's important to um, acknowledge the fact that we work primarily in the peer-reviewed space. So this is a difficult challenge for us. We're 
you know, if we move into the preprints area, we have to be really cognizant of the fact that we want to keep our data curated well. We want to make sure that it is high quality, heavily evaluated, curated information, um, and we want to make sure that uh, we're not bringing in preprint content that could muddy the water. Right? We have to we have to kind of kind of maintain that vigilance on the the quality of this literature, even as we bring other data types into our platforms. But uh, we are working on the preprint space. Um, there's something else that I think you'll find interesting in our, our Profiles Not Metrics publication, and that is the, um, the beam plot. So we'll be introducing this into the Web of Science, and you'll see it in um, the implications of that in um, Insights as well. So if you look at this beam plot on the left-hand side, it's looking at an individual's performance over the course of a career. And you can see that there's a median percentile for uh, this particular researcher, and you will see the individual papers represented on these beams moving laterally across the screen. So you get a full picture of where all of the different papers of this particular researcher are performing over time by citation percentile and by their own median citation percentile. So this is really a good look at the complete spectrum of what a, a, research, uh, a researcher has produced and uh, a little bit more effective than maybe looking at something like an H-index, which is a, a simple arrangement or a simple count. So look for this type of um, uh, indicator and, and uh, metric approach with um, the individual researcher performance in the, uh, the beam plots. Another thing that we're looking at is the context of where citations occur. So when we look at research integrity, when we look at um, understanding the value of a citation, what's the, the value of a single citation? Well, is it coming from the materials and methods section? Is it coming from the introduction? Is it coming from uh, the results section of the paper. What, what's the meaningfulness or the context of where that citation count is coming from, and how does that contribute to a paper's significance in the global landscape? How can we predict what that paper's citation potential will be based upon the section of the article that's being cited? So uh, this is a good, we think, a good predictive measure on uh, where, where papers are going to go in terms of their citation profile. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to wrap things up because we're right at the end of our time span here. Um, I wanted to give you a, a list of places to go to stay in touch. Um, all of the, the spots that you see here in that bright pink are links that you can click later on. We do have our own Insights Forum on November 19th. There's a click there to register. We do have an Insights User Group. It's a Google group. You can click there to join that Google group. Um, you can access the, um, the papers that we have available. Uh, you can access some of our blog posts. We do have a Web of Science newsletter that you can sign up for. So all of those things are listed out on this slide. And on what I promise is the last slide, um, there's a, a great resource here in our Insights Benchmarking and Analytics Training Resources page. It's available around the clock. It has our learning portal. Um, we just launched a, a new LMS course link. Uh, that's um, here as well. That should be in red, but that's, uh, that's a direct link too. Um, we are training not only on our our products, but also on uh, the things like uh, we heard about today on bibliometrics and how to do that responsibly. So all of those resources are clickable and linkable from this PowerPoint. I think we'll uh, work with Chris and Yao Ling to make sure that this is available to you uh, in the Slack channel or, or however they're going to distribute uh, this information. And I am going to wrap up by saying thank you and leaving us a, a few minutes here to yeah. Answer questions. So, Anne, I, I don't know. How yeah. I, I've, I've seen lots Hi. of comments and questions coming in. So. <laughs> I know. It's been great. Yeah. I'll take can you a hear breath me? And you can, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll take a breath and let you. you yeah, definitely. Let take a break. Been... Yeah, sure. So, yeah, thank you for all of your questions and comments. I've been trying as fast as I can. It's a good thing I'm a fast taper to, uh, to answer everyone's uh, questions. So, I think I've done that uh, pretty successfully. Um, you know, which is great because we don't have a ton of time now. And there's a bunch of links uh, I put in there for our training resources and especially um, the course that Tom mentioned just briefly at the end. This is something we just recently released. It's a, it's a preparing to use insights course, but it's really about fundamentals of bibliometrics. So um, we want people to use the data responsibly and correctly, and we think it's very important that they understand these foundational principles before using it. So if any of you are at that beginning stage of just trying to get into this field and really trying to understand some of the concepts that are being presented this week, um, you're very welcome to take that course. It's, you know, interactive. It's totally free. You don't need to subscribe to any of our products or anything. So we'd love uh, for you to take advantage of that. 
Um, let me see uh, if there's any additional questions. I'll just call out maybe a couple things. So the uh, Classification and reclassification of, of articles came up a couple times, and I'm glad, Tom, at the end you showed the topical clustering that we're going to be adding to Insights, so it's all kind of related. Um, so please, you know, keep an eye out for that if you're an Insights user, and, you know, you could take a look um, at the chat, or we can put it in the Slack, you know, how we look at multidisciplinary journals right now and reclassify them based on an algorithm of their cited references to put them into a, a specific category. That's done in insights and um, essential science indicators. Um, another thing I'll just point out that was really interesting at the beginning, someone asked about retractions. And, uh, you know, in the Web of Science core collection, we do have a document type for retraction notices as well as retracted articles. And then that carries over to insights. So you can identify and filter out if you wanted to um, articles that have been officially retracted. So just wanted to uh, point that one out. But other than that, I think we, we answered everything. Um, our emails are here. So, you know, if there are other questions, and we'll try to um, look at the Slack as well, we'll post the slide deck to Slack. Um, and we're always happy to talk with anyone and, you know, if you want to explore some of these topics more. Right, and and just to wrap that up, Anne, um, your email and my email address are on this slide, and and the reason is we want you to, you know, add us to the list of friends in the that global community that um, that Lizzie was talking about earlier on. So if we can help you or direct you to the right people to get the answers you need, we're happy to do that. Um, don't hunt around too long; just shoot us a note, and we will get you in touch with the right people. Really, thank you, and we're, we're humbled to join such a large audience today. Really, thank you for your your attention and your time today. We hope that. Um, uh, you'll continue to find value in the resources that we have and, and certainly in the new features and the new things that we're releasing uh, at, literally as we speak. So i um, glad to have you with us and uh, appreciate all your time today. And um, then Chris and Yaoling, just let us know the best way to um, distribute the materials afterward, and we'll, we'll help with that as well. Sure. Yeah, if you want to go ahead and post these slides to the Slack channel, I think that would be the best way to go. And then Perfect. we can figure out other ways to distribute after that. But I think this, this Slack is probably where we're going to post a lot of things. So, yeah, if you could post those there, that'd be great. Thank you. Will do. Great. So, um, thank you again, everyone, for having such a, a lovely discussion. Thanks again to Tom and Ann for doing the, the presentation today. Uh, we are going to take another quick break, um, and we'll come back here at 5 p.m. Eastern for our final session of the day, which is a training session on Voss Viewer by Karen Goodsman. So thanks again, and we'll um, come back again at five.